everybody. It is February 25th, 2022. We just passed 2222 day. And it is a Friday morning, 11 o'clock Eastern time. So of course, it's Tales from the Heart with Lisa Salber. And my special guest today is Dr. Steve Amon. And we will be having a discussion today about Heart Month, Heart Awareness. And as this is Dr. Amon's first visit to Tales from the Heart, we're going to get to know him a little bit and understand why he is involved in the HCM community. Good morning, Dr. Steve Allman. Good morning, Lisa. Nice to see you. Good to be with you today. So um, we're going to have my, my wonderful HCMA team be putting some links in our chat as we go along today. So uh, you can keep along with the conversation and use those links for later. There's some of them in the notes here. If you're listening in podcast world, after the live broadcast, you can see the links on the um, podcast description, or you can visit 4hcm.org. So we are at the end of Heart Month, and we've gone through a lot this month, which we'll go through in some detail later today. Before we kind of get started, I want to hear from Dr. Steve Allman exactly what a kid from normal is doing at the Mayo Clinic um, treating HCM. So Steve, welcome and tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> Thanks for that, Lisa. It's, uh, yes, it's an amazing fact. I was born in a town called Normal uh, and, and all my formative years were raised there. So, you know, how did I get involved in HCM? You know, I can largely attribute that to Dr. Nishimura. Uh, Nish has been my, mentor and life coach for a long time. He and I first met in when he was my teacher in the first year medical school course. And he even taught HCM to first year medical students uh, uh, back then. And as he and I started working together more and more, I recognized that from a scientist standpoint, from a learner standpoint, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy offered all the things that were interesting to me. My undergraduate degrees in engineering, and you talk about how the blood flows through the heart and causes the mitral valve to move funky and, and how changes in the loading conditions uh, impact a gradient or an obstruction is, is my sweet spot from my college engineering days. It also uh, had electrical phenomena, which, you know, electrophysiology is something that was always interesting to me. So the issues with arrhythmias uh, were important. And the fact that we get to see patients of every age. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's a disease that affects every aspect of life. It impacts families. So it just, it checked all kinds of boxes that were interesting to me. And then with Dr. Nishimura and Dr. Tajik giving me the opportunity to uh, expand the research at Mayo Clinic on HCM and to take over the clinical operations for HCM, it really was just a great opportunity um, at, at, at my professional home base. And then, you know, getting to meet the small HCM provider community that's out there, uh, the, which is really quite close. I mean, yeah, in some ways, we're all rivals to some degree in terms of research things, but we're all pretty friendly, too. So to get to meet Barry, you know, the, the godfather of HCM, essentially, uh, as a as a fellow and trainee and start to have dialogues with him and publish a few papers with him. And now then subsequently Marty and our colleagues from internationally, it's, it's really been a, a very rewarding thing. And then working with you and the HCMA on really helping patients who have this disease understand what it means, uh, fill in those knowledge gaps that are super scary for some people. Uh, you know, the unknown is sometimes the worst fear. And, and helping uh, provide those things. And this extending the general knowledge about HCM to, to other providers has been a, it's just been incredibly rewarding. Well, as we are both, what, 28, 29 years old now, um, it's kind of astounding to think that, I think I've known you for about 25 or 26 years since the very, very beginning of the HCMA. Yeah. You were this little young upstart. I was, yeah. So, yeah, so we, we probably met I probably came out to the Morristown HCMA annual meeting was probably the first one I attended. And that was probably in 98 or 99, I think. That one, we moved it to Morristown. So Persephone was 97, 98. So 99 was our first year in Morristown. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. God, that was a long time ago, but we've done yes. so much since then. Yes. So much since then. I, I want to get back to uh, live meetings. And this might serve as a little bit of an announcement. 
but the goal will be to bring back the annual meeting in 2024. So oh, we get through the pandemic, we calm down. Okay, completely unscripted, but many years ago, I think the 2014 meeting, the last one we actually had in Morristown, you said to me, I see a day where there's gonna be all these different centers who each have their own little table here. And I went, no, it's not gonna get that big. <laughs> um, we what? have 40, 43 programs now with uh, almost 20 others under review. Yeah. So um, I, I didn't see the future the same way that you did then, but I definitely see it similarly in that way now. And who would have thought that not only did we develop more and more of these centers over the years, but then when the guidelines came out, surprise, surprise, high volume care was defined. Mm -hmm. And we, you, you took the, the weight off my shoulder in the terminology of comprehensive and primary. So thank you writing committee, because then I have something to go by. Um, it's not just, we think so. Um, and surprise, surprise, it's exactly what we've been doing for 20 years. Yeah, that was that was really the goal is getting that socialized out there that that there there can be some definitions that involve outcomes and uh, that we expect and hope for the best for our patients and we should be striving to achieve those and sometimes that can only occur where you're doing things regularly and frequently and and to your point it it needs to not be something that feels like a black box and people are wondering where the criteria came from so let's put some some objective criteria and then we can debate them and refine them over time if we need to but and i think that is exactly what we've been doing collectively patient community clinician community researcher community we all get to a level of understanding and we all nudge each other up a notch and up yeah. a notch and up a notch and that's that's the beauty of what's actually happened here. So I'm really happy about that. So you've been at Mayo Clinic how long now? Well, I went to Mayo Clinic in 1988 to start medical school. And then uh, after all my internal med medical school and internal medicine and cardiology training, I uh, started on staff there in 1999. Well, In yeah. the last century. <laughs> Oh, honey, don't, don't do that. That just makes us sound way too old, um, but it's a good thing. Yeah. Okay, so you're at Mayo, you're in this high volume HCM center. You've got two of probably the most world-renowned uh, surgeons in HCM, and you do a great volume of myectomy every year as well as other procedures and, and services for the HCM community. What today in 2022, what is it that you think is really interesting about HCM, where we've been, where we're going? You've got a really good global view. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. You can, you can tackle it in several ways. And one of them, we kind of hinted at in the introduction a little bit, and that is the general knowledge about what HCM and what it means has progressed a lot from, you know, in the last 23 years uh, that we've been, you know, working together. Um, patients know more when they come into the into the office. They're asking next level questions rather than first level questions. Providers, referrers, are sending patients not just says kind of HCM help. It says, "I'm wondering if this person needs to have a defibrillator because of these two reasons, and would they ever be a candidate for surgery or something else?" So, so even the the some of the referrals we get are are next level. I think because of the efforts that we've all done at trying to raise this. So so that's super interesting. I think that um, all the research that that many of our colleagues are doing that are showing that with the appropriate care, patients can do really well and expect a normal longevity and and those kind of things is so eye opening because it, it, as you know, I'm you hear it many times per day someone gets this diagnosis and the first thing they do is go to the internet and they see all the dramatic stories out there. And so it's important that we remind people that people that are living normal lives don't often blog about it. Whereas people who are suffering or have had dramatic consequences do. And, and it's human nature to do that, but we don't want to doom scroll HCM. There's lots of positivity out there. So that's a great point. And earlier this week, we, <laughs> People have seen my face way too much on the internet this week because I spent all day on HCM day 
casting, uh, podcasting and uh, web webinaring and streaming on Facebook and whatever. Um, with so many thought leaders, we had visits from a number of centers. We spoke to industry and we even had Barry Marion himself come talk to us. Um, and Barry brought up a point, which is a tough one. And that is like, we're doing so good in HCM centers treating HCM patients. And we have improved mortality. We have improved quality of life for so many people, but it's not, we're not done yet. That incremental change, we have to keep growing. So I love what Barry said that we're doing so well now. And maybe he and I have a little disagreement on where we might be going in the future. But where do you think about the future? Where are we going? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I, I I think that we will continue to make progress. We obviously don't want to be complacent. And, and, and to, to Barry's point, we can't we can't assume we mission accomplished is not a thing. It's always it's always going to get better. I mean, it, it is an exciting era that we now do have uh, companies who are investigating potential therapies directly for HCM, not that HCM has to adopt someone else's therapies and hope that it might work in HCM. That is super exciting stuff for us that, that, that are working in this field is that we actually have attention being paid uh, that, it, that it's gonna benefit patients. Um, I think that we'll see how those new therapies fit into the broader algorithm that's not defined yet. We're, we're going to have to see how that goes over, over a significant period of time here in terms of longer term efficacy, longer term safety. Um, when do you flex in and flex out of new therapies? How much it costs? All those kind of things are yet to be defined, but, but, but that's going on. And I think that there's broader interest across hospital systems to meet the needs of patients in their local markets that have HCM. I will, I will pivot slightly and say one of the things that is potentially a benefit of the public health emergence we've gone to is the emergence of virtual care and telemedicine as an option, which means I'm actually doing lots of virtual consults for patients to determine whether they need to travel to Minnesota or not. Uh, and, and that patient doesn't have to buy plane tickets or leave work or leave school uh, to get that. And as long as we can continue to provide those types of services, some of this is a plea to the federal government and state government and those types of things to recognize the value to the human beings that are impacted by less common diseases, yeah. that, that's going to make a big difference. The centers now become more accessible to more people. Um, and I think that's a great, a great trend. So if memory serves me correctly, about five, it's right after my transplant. So it's gotta be like four and a half years ago. You and I had a nice long talk about what's this telemedicine thing that you're doing out there and, mm -hmm. and how does it work and how do you do a virtual appointment? And at that point, I think you were doing them through regional doctor's offices. Patients would come in there and then they would do a virtual with you. So they didn't have to come all the way into your city. Um, so you're kind of a pioneer in, in the virtual visit. How has it changed over that last four and a half years or so since you've really focused on this? That's a great question. I, th I think it's changed a few ways. One is people are realize they're comfortable with it. I think there was a fear of entry to begin with, and then people realized how familiar it has become to, to get on a video camera with your kids or your parents or now your doctors or your bankers or whomever. It's now become just part of our existence culturally to be able to do this. So, you know, taking the video telemedicine to patients in their homes or if the patient happens to be in his or her office, you know, it, it's, it's convenient for the patient uh, rather than making them stop their lives in order to connect uh, in a specific facility. We're seeing increasing use um, in many areas outside of cardiology and inside of cardiology of having patients with devices that monitor heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, oxygen saturations, those types of things that are automatically ported to the medical record of the, of the care team that's taking care of that patient. So that patients that used to have to be in the hospital are now at home and getting yeah. that level of care. And we've shown great improvement in outcomes. And you can only imagine 
bed availability and cost to the system by having patients cared for in their own home with their own family around them, rather than taking up beds in the hospital and being isolated from their loved ones makes such a big difference. And that's a trend that I, I am quite confident will continue to go. And then beyond that, we'll start seeing for many diseases and historically diabetes is the best uh, example, patients will learn how to manage some of their own stuff on the fly uh, based on data and feedbacks and patterns that we've worked on together, and then they'll be able to, to adjust things. So diabetics adjust their insulin. People that have dilated cardiomyopathy and have congestive heart failure are often adjusting their own Lasix doses on a day-by-day -day basis based on weight and symptom status and those types of things. But we'll be seeing products that come to market that help guide patients through that and they're being monitored at the same time by their trusted care team. And so I think that's going to be a great uh, uh, evolution for what we're doing. So you talked about two different things there. So home technologies mm -hmm. is one. And I can remember when um, a live core cardio monitor uh, came onto the market and seeing, I forget his name right now, but the guy who created it with his son in the garage and got in trouble from the FDA and then got approval. That was actually, uh, it's actually a great story. You got to yeah. go read that. Maybe I'll have him on someday to talk about that. Yeah. Um, but that has been a game changer just to be able to take an EKG strip when you're not feeling well and say, forward this in an email to my doctor. Mm -hmm. And it's not this um, vague description to you. I felt like this. And then you have to guess what rhythm that was right. by their words. You actually can see, oh, no, no, it's just you just had a little SVT that's not dangerous, or these were just PVCs, or you need to come and talk to me. You know, you can have those conversations quite quickly. Um, I know of at least a dozen cases of the cardio monitor catching something life altering, I'll call it, that yep. made the physician say, oh, no, now, now I see what's going on. Because I've always been of the opinion that halter monitors and event monitors have a tendency of curing arrhythmias temporarily. <laughs> the minute you put it on, it's not going to happen. So this was a great alternative to that. So we have, um, I just want to pause to the Facebook community who's listening right now. If you have any questions, you can post them here. Um, but I'm going to pivot our conversation a little bit here towards it's heart month. Okay, so we've all heard all the heart messages all month and our community put out a message a day. So a number of patients from Mayo were our HCM warriors of the day. And we just flooded social media. We come up with a frame to say, I'm a heart warrior. I'm an HCM warrior. And it's getting out there. Why is awareness of not only heart disease generally, but HCM specifically, why is it important? Yeah, I mean, I, I can take the big one, the heart disease. Obviously, it is the leading cause of, of death and, and disability uh, in our society. And so just having awareness helps people maybe address the things that are in their control uh, to manage. But when you focus on something like HCM, it, it, it's important because there are people, and you know this well, who get other diagnoses before they actually arrive at the correct diagnosis, what they have, and they continue to suffer from symptoms that decrease their quality of life, their happiness, their ability to partake, partake in activities or family type things, that if only they had the right diagnosis, they could be on a path to, to wellness. So it's super important that way, but it's also equally as important uh, if I don't know someone has HCM and maybe they're obstructive and they get diagnosed with hypertension and I pull a medication to treat hypertension off the shelf, it's going to make them worse. So, so there, there are ramifications for other therapies specific around HCM. And then, of course, with HCM, the familial aspect of it, if, if patient A has HCM, well, then we have to be worrying about their family for several shells around that. And if we just ignore that the person has that diagnosis, well, other members of the family may be suffering as well. So uh, uh, awareness is, you know, it, it is the key to helping people stay healthy and happy longer. I agree. And throughout this month, we, um, first we, we cultivated some stories in advance to share each day of the month. 
And then on HCM day, something unexpected happened in our little Facebook group of oh, 08,000 people. Um, people started just writing their own stories. Oh. And I said, if you give me consent, I will share it on the Facebook page. So there are the HCMA testimonials that are on our website. And then this week, we doubled our numbers. Another like 40 stories were shared. Wow. And so there's total for the month, there's like 80 different stories being shared for the month. That is a teensy tiny bit of the total HCM population. But when you read the 80, you really get the whole view of what families are going through and individuals are going through from babies being diagnosed to people in their 60s getting transplants and everything in between. Stories about their 90 year old parents who have HCM and didn't even know it and now do. So it's, it, there's all kinds of great stories out there. But there's a theme in a lot of them, the misdiagnosis. Mm -hmm. I had an innocent murmur when I was a kid. I had athletically induced asthma later. So we're, we've, we've got to do the next step and that's educate physicians on what to look for. Yeah. So we, we've got HCM Academy that's out there now. And then you've got the, the good news and the news that some people find concerning. And that is there are pharmaceuticals being developed for HCM right now. And what is the role of these companies to help raise awareness? And what is the role of figuring out which tool in the toolbox, which drug is coming up that might be right for somebody? And I think you and I both kind of struggle with that industry and independence and how do you merge the two? And it's a tricky line. We all must be transparent. And Bristol Myers Squibb helped fund HCM Awareness Day by providing media outreach. And they funded all of the media placement and sponsored some stories in like Parade Magazine that, Doug, uh, that uh, Mike Ackerman even participated in. And that's a good partnership. But we all have to be aware that okay. it's it's a business for some and it's lives for others. So any words of wisdom for patients about trust? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I I think it's it, it, it's it's just being aware that there are potential other motives for individuals or companies. And it's not anything different than, than, you know, you get something pushed to your, your email in basket and it looks, you know, great, but then you have to wonder what, what was the motivation behind that? I, I mean, I, the, the amount of funding that has gone towards HCM education, particularly in the last two to three years is unbelievably fantastic because we are able to create high quality educational programs. The thing is to making sure that the person who's controlling the content and the delivery of that so uh, is independent, that the, that, the, that the funding source or the grant to do that isn't somehow a quid pro quo, but rather an independent, unrestricted uh, uh, grant or funding source that allows the professional to provide you with the best available evidence that is not dictated or scripted by somebody else. We have to do that with publications that we submit to journals. Every time I give a, a talk to medical professional audience, you know, you have to disclose any relationships you have, uh, any grants you've received, et cetera. Um, fortunately, I, I have none. Uh, so I can, I feel like I can be a, a, an independent voice uh, for us. But those are the things that you need to look for as a consumer is if there, if there was a funding source, whomever that is, did they have any control over the content or science or the, the messaging that was given? And, and in, in most programs, the answer to that is no, but it's worth asking that question every time. Exactly. So clinical trials are important mm -hmm. and clinical trials have to be funded. Yep. So sponsors fund the trial. They work with clinicians. They have a governing body or organizing body, a CRO, who's the guidance between the two entities to keep everything pure. And eventually, if what they've developed works for us, it's going to come to market. 
and they're going to want to make their money back on what they did. Yep. And they're going to want to make a profit because they're in a business and that's okay yep. if they're helping us. Um, so I think we're, we're in a new time. We didn't, I think the only time we really had like the, the, the issues with, with industry prior to this was devices. Yep. Medtronic versus Guidant versus Boston Scientific and yep. Abbott. Yep. And then they bought like all these different names and Biotronics comes in, but it was the therapy. And we always talked about the therapy. Right. And there's nuances between each device and the EPs and the patient can decide which ones they want. But drugs are a little bit different. They may have unintended consequences that we don't know about yet because we still need to learn. Mm -hmm. And they are a consumable. So you're, you're constantly spending money on it. Yep. Um, so we need to be aware that people have worked really hard to bring these things to us and we have to find the right people at the right time. And I believe that there is an obligation and each one of the companies that is developing drugs in the space of HCM has, has stepped up. They have an obligation to help educate patients and they should do it through HCMA and other organizations like us to just stay clear of salesmanship and just go to education. Let us educate let us do our job. And we've had some really great partners so far to do that. So any other thoughts about industry in the future? Yeah, I think, I think that is such a tough line for, for everyone to walk. I mean, as, as you said, you, you empathize with a company who is in a for-profit world. They, they have to do that to survive. And so one of the things education uh, remember, we, we can all say things, and, and you, you do this in your daily life, you can give the same message to two people and get different answers based on your tone of voice, or the order of the words you choose. And again, for patients and, and providers out there, when, when you hear, and this isn't specific to the HCM stuff we're talking about, this is just in general, the commercials you see on TV or whatever, when you hear about percentages of success or percentages of reductions, remember most of the time, there is a longstanding history in the drug industry of giving you what are called relative reductions rather than absolute changes. So they will tell you that there was 50% fewer deaths with drug B. Well, that might be a change from 2% to 1%. So the absolute change is only 1%, but it is a relative 50% change. And don't get swayed by those big numbers. Talk to your doctor, talk to someone who is paying attention to those absolute changes. 37% of the patients achieved the study endpoint, whereas 17% of placebo patients did. That means there was an absolute change of very small numbers, actually. So I think it's, you just have to make sure you're, you're not falling victim to a sales pitch. And that is going to be a huge challenge for this community in the next couple of years because new drugs will come. They will be novel. Mm -hmm. They have mechanisms that work well for some, not for others. And then there will be different versions of the same concept. Yeah. So we're all learning together yeah. and we've spent 23 years. So let's go back. Okay. When when we first started this game, and I did this with Barry the other day too, dual chamber pacing was the thing that was going to solve all the problems. Followed right on the cusp of that was alcohol septal ablation was going to fix everything. Mm -hmm. And we pretty much said dual chamber pacing, like teensy tiny group of people might benefit from that. Alcohol septal ablation, a good chunk of people yep. could qualify for that. Yep. Um, and since then, we really haven't gotten anywhere else, have we? Right. That's, that, that's about right. And so I think that well, there's one message there, and that is there isn't going to be one thing that is going to make a change for every patient with HCM. I mean, we've been talking about this forever, that HCM is not a cookie cutter condition. It, you know, whether you have obstruction or not depending on how thick your walls are, whether you have atrial fibrillation, risk for sudden death, all those things are different. So that will be a combination of things uh, applied at the appropriate pathways for the appropriate patients that will raise the water level for everyone and make them feel better. So um, yes, the use of a drug 
is going to be more available to people because you won't necessarily have to go to the super experienced myectomy surgeon or super experienced uh, ablationist. Uh, but learning to use that drug in the right situation for the right patient will make a difference. Um, and uh, that's that's some of the craftsmanship or artisanship of of caring for patients with HCM is trying to understand the balance of what that person is experiencing in their life and why, and then finding the therapies to, to meet that. So you come from a unique, yep. and I'll call it privileged position of having been educated in HCM by both Rick Nishimura and Jamil Tajik. Yep. Um, and Barry was up the street for a long time. Yep. Yep. So you are the recipient of core knowledge from the beginning. For those who don't know, Dr. Jamil Tajik did some of the earliest works in echocardiography evaluation, along with Pravin Shah and Barry Marin. Like these were the early guys. Yep. And you got to learn at the hands of one. And then he trained, or I guess him and Rick kind of came up yep. slightly right after each other. And then here you are. So you have this, and the, the engineering background, I always forget that about you because that's why you think structurally. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you think, I always tell people with HCM, you have to understand your anatomy and then you have to understand a little bit of geometry and then you have to understand a little bit of engineering, electrical and, and mechanical. And if you put those all together, that's HCM. So it's really not complicated, is it? And everybody laughs at that point because they're like, I don't know any of that stuff <laughs> in my daily life because I'm, you know, I'm a school teacher or whatever. I don't think that way. But you learn from these guys, you're teaching other guys and girls, mm -hmm. and you have this depth of knowledge and expertise, but your community cardiology, I won't call them, well, they're your cardiology peers, but in community practice, they don't have this depth of knowledge because they're more generalists. How do HCM patients keep themselves safe with community cardiologists who know a little from somebody who knows all of it or nearly all of it? Because I don't think anybody knows all. So I, I you know, it's it's a great question. I I I think that many cardiologists are no longer shooting from the hip if they don't know HCM. They're recognizing you know what, I don't know the answers to this. Let me get them to one of, to one of these uh, places that has a dedicated program to HCM. It's been, it's not nearly as common now that I get patients um, sent to me where someone has done things wrong just out of simple lack of knowledge or overconfidence. People are saying, oh, you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, we should probably have you go to one of the centers and, and, and Mayo is in, in your network or Mayo is in your region. Let's, let's have you go there. So I think that, you know, we've seen a positive change in that. Um, and I think it's through things like the education that we've done for physicians and the guidelines and then educating patients so that they know, gosh, there's a checklist of things that ought to be being addressed. And I'm only, I've only heard two out of the six so far, maybe I should go somewhere else. So I think that, I think that, I, and, and we've done this for a lot of things, we've empowered patients. They have to be their own advocates. And I think the, the work that you've done and, and some of the other groups have done is trying to give people a toolkit to say, I, I need to make sure I understand family screening. I need to understand whether I'm at risk for cardiac arrest. I need to understand what pills I should and shouldn't be on, uh, uh, et cetera. I think we have to do that as a multi-pronged approach. I think we've, we are well on that journey. And we have a lot of people that know what they don't know and will refer now. I go back to the early days, the 90s, when I would talk to people who were in community care. And I'd say, you know, I got a couple of people who really know this disease and I'd send them over to you guys or Cleveland or to Barry or over to Mark Sherrod. Like there, there was like, I had like seven that I could trust that like, you'd get it all right, you know? And the local cardiologists were very resident, uh, resistant, excuse me, to go ahead and want to be part of that joint partnership with that patient. 
they would want to take the lead. Well, yeah, you can go hear what they say, but I'm your hometown doctor and I'm in charge. That is completely turned around in 20 years. Completely. Yeah, I, I, I think there was, there, was a, there was an era, and maybe there still is in, around some conditions, where, where there was a, a fear or a, a, an ownership concern for, for an individual patient. And uh, the fact is, is that the, you know, we don't want to take over life care for a patient who, who has come 400, 500, 1,000 miles away to see us here. I can't be their doctor that sees them today. I'm not their primary cardiologist. I'm a, a consultative cardiologist that's helping them and their primary team uh, manage together. And so we, we enter that as a, as a partnership. And I think that we have, again, as an HCM provider community, done a good job of getting it out there. We're not here to deal patients from you or, or, or tell the patients where you're wrong or, or any of those kind of things. It's, it's a partnership and we all, we all have compliments where we're, we're better uh, and, and not as good as, as our other partners in any team we work on. And, and that's the way we're trying, trying to, to tell this. And I, I tell all my patients, you're welcome to come back and see me on an annual basis, but you need to see your cardiologist at home too, because if on some random Thursday, you're having palpitations, you need someone there who knows what your diagnosis is uh, so they can get to the answer sooner. And I can't do that from a thousand miles away. Or when they show up in the emergency room in the middle of the night. Right. Yep. So who's gonna be there? Who's gonna be that first call? And how do you keep that person safe yep. in those very rare circumstances where somebody must go to the ER in the morning or in the middle yeah. of the night and nobody's around? So I think we've done pretty good so far. And we've got a long way to go. All right. Yep. But but we we've, we've done well thus far. I do want to ask you about a new upcoming area and just get your spidey okay. sense at eleven forty one a.m. on the on February twenty second, two thousand twenty two. We'll replay this in a couple of years and see oh, yeah. to, to see where we went. Okay. Yep. Um, genetic therapies. Wow, that is a hard one for me. Um, I. You know, HCM is is really complicated in terms of the genetics. There there are diseases like cystic fibrosis that are single gene uh, diseases, and it becomes much easier for researchers and drug companies to target single gene defects than a condition like HCM, where there are literally hundreds of genetic variants that result in this in this condition. That said our world seems to solve math problems pretty well. And eventually that becomes a math problem that we're trying to solve. So I, I think at some point we will have some gene directed therapies for HCM. The, the, the question is whether we will have them be specific to individual variants or individual genes or whether there's a final common pathway that all those variants point to that can be uh, the, the goal of that therapy. And, and I don't know, it's, 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 it's hard work because of that diversity that we have uh, in our community. Yeah. My, my gene mutation in myosin binding protein C is a private mutation to my family. Only members of my own family have the exact same mutation. So yeah. can I look forward to a day where somebody targets my family with a gene repair? Like, yeah. I, like that's yeah. hypothetical and, at this point. And, and, unless there's an underlying technology and then you, you know, say, so, you know, fill in name here and you fill in, you know, you know, Salberg variant here, if that kind of platform approach is taken possibly, but I, you know, that's, I'm, I'm way outside my level of expertise in terms of uh, desi designer drug and gene therapeutics. I, I, I'm right there with you. Um, I'm excitedly listening to new therapies, new, new concepts, new hypothesis, and hope that some of them you know, turn into something good for us. Mm -hmm. um, and we're all going to have to sit, watch, participate, tear it apart, <laughs> build it back up, tear it apart, build it back up. And that's how we build a stronger house. Yeah. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can get there. So we have a question from the community. And then I have a couple that I just want to kind of give shouts out to. Um, let's going back to the referral to the community cardiologist and working in tandem. Are there any like best practices to get that community cardiologist and the HCM specialist in a good communications pattern? 
Oh, so that's, you know, that's, that's interesting because it kind of depends on the personal preferences of both, both of those individuals and best communication styles. So um, some people want to get on the phone and talk about the patient before and after they have come to a center, et cetera. Other people are so busy, they, they don't want to have to take time out of their day to have a even 10 minute phone conversation. They'd rather have you send them a note or a, or a message and just say, we got this, bullets one, two, and three. And so it's it somewhat it's establishing a little bit of a relationship and, and, and seeing over time how that morphs for, for a given patient. But it, there's, there's no, no one best solution. And, and I think, and I've used this analogy in other venues, it's, it shouldn't be surprising. I mean, think about uh, socially when you uh, meet someone and you decide you're going to have a dinner with them. Most of the time right now, that starts off as a text. If it goes smoothly as a text, then you both show up at the restaurant or the group shows up at a restaurant and it's great. But as soon as there's any confusion, well, then you convert that text to a phone call and you kind of get it, get it out of the way quicker. And so we need to flex that way in our professional communications as well, is, is um, recognize that everyone's busy, uh, communicate concisely, but flex up as needed to make sure the communication is shared uh, and completed. I agree. I think my charts and that type of portal technology has improved to a certain degree. Um, there's there's an interesting. Well, what, what, one of the nice things that, that I will I'm going to interrupt you just briefly is <laughs> the, the, the recent change in requirements on what the documentation needs to be from the provider has made the notes much better now. So there was a while where we were required to document all of this stuff, which was not what you would want to communicate to another provider. We're now able to document much more concisely what our treatment plan is, why in a concise way, and, and not have to have the, the distracting information that it's not that it's irrelevant to the patient, but it's, but it's, not, a, it's not an effective communication tool. And now we're allowed to use our documentation as an effective communication tool. Uh, uh, so, so, so those changes, I, I think, will be beneficial. But there are still issues. The EHRs are not completely interchangeable. Uh, the notes transfer from one EHR to another, and they, they get into this really poor formatted uh, uh, way to look at things. So now I'll uninterrupt you and let you finish your thought. <laughs> Well, you brought up a really, really great point that, you know, we, we've changed what was in the portals to begin with. Everybody was really cautious about what they would put in there and how they could communicate and where it was going and who was going to, who was going to house it. And we've got through all of that. And now we're getting down to better communications and yep. 26 years. I think if I had to synthesize, you know, all of the work that we've done down to a couple of key bullet points as to what has made improvements and where there's still room for improvements. It's communications, communication, and communications. Yep. It's the awareness communication, the, the payer communications, it's the provider communications, it's the inter-provider communications. And I have found that just about every single person that I have met in clinical or research or industry care or research or innovation for HCM, when you can look them in the eye and have a conversation, it's amazing how far things go. And, and you just talk. <laughs> yeah, you know, there is truth to that. I mean, there is a reason why we do face-to-face -face meetings and do video meetings, and it is to see nonverbal communication cues. And I'll, I'll, I'll share an anecdote from, from this week. I, I had a patient that I saw who the path, the next step, was not as obvious as it had seemed up front. But because we were both sitting in an office with mask on, we had a hard time connecting because we couldn't, we couldn't quite communicate to the same degree 
it, as as if we didn't have the mask on, and it it it, it was a challenge. And imagine you take away all verbal clues, not just the lower half of your face clues as to how that communication is going. It does provide challenges, and we've all made the mistake of over interpreting email messages or text messages, you interpret tone that isn't intended or wasn't there. And so we need to have real holistic communication uh, to make sure that, that we're on the same page about what we're talking about. From my 18 years in human resources, my, my first evaluation of any confrontational situation was intent and perception. Yep. What did that person intend to say? How was it perceived? was it correct? Yeah. And I would say over 80% of the time, the perception was incorrect of the intent. So mm -hmm. if you could clarify those, you're better. So understanding anatomy in HCM is complicated stuff. Understanding personal choice is hard. Yeah. Understanding yeah. how to put personal choice on a complicated matter, even more so. And I'm gonna leave with, there's a couple of comments here we'll get to in a second but I, I, you're the shared decision-making guy. Like, I, I suspect that you were the one to put that on the table and go, we need to put this in the guidelines. And while I love it, I'm also a little afraid of it. Yep. Because shared means the patient has to raise its knowledge and understanding to be able to make that shared decision. And the other part of that that scares me a little is I know how busy you guys are in clinic. And I know the resources and the time that you have available to educate them. And I suspect that you thought when you put that in there, oh, Lisa, I love this one, but you just made <laughs> my life 10 times harder because now I feel this obligation to educate yeah. people even higher. And we met the challenge. We've created new tools and we're helping that. But tell me about that process. Yeah, no, that's, th th those are really excellent points. So, I mean, the, the whole concept behind, behind shared decision making is allowing patients to have a voice in there in, in the decisions about what tests and procedures and therapies uh, happen. But that does assume an interest in doing that and or having a right level of education so that you, you can reasonably participate. It doesn't require top level knowledge to make that, but it, but it does require some conversational techniques from physicians. And you're absolutely right. The busier the practice, the harder it is to take the time and pause to say, what are you hoping to get out of this interaction? You, you know, if this therapy with the most it offers is this. Um, I mean, I think, I think one of the, one of the, specific questions that comes up or statements that comes up not infrequently in my interactions is you're talking to someone about their risk for cardiac arrest and the patient will say, well, I'll wait until I start having more symptoms and then I'll address that. Yep. And, and, and you do have to pause and say, the reason why it's called sudden cardiac arrest is because you don't have that warning up front that your symptoms are getting worse and now it's time to address it. This is an independent decision. So the defibrillator isn't gonna make you feel better. It's not gonna make you stronger, better, faster. It might make you feel less stressed because you know you have a safety net, but it's not gonna change those other things, nor are those other things gonna change this necessarily. So, but you have to pause and you have to talk through that because it's, it, I, I understand where that notion comes from. For most conditions, you know, B comes because A happened, but that's not the, that's not the case here. Um, I'm going to put a tag here because what you just said there about sudden cardiac arrest risk, it, it's something we deal with every day at the HCMA. People say a lot. They told me I needed a defibrillator, but I feel fine. I'm like, oh, please. And the ones that don't heed the warning early, they're not here to talk to you anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yes. So, but so, so shared decision making, I want to make another couple of statements about that. So, one is to, is to get away from dogmatic uh, decisions made for patients by people who are paternalistic health care dad says you have to no but it's also not forcing the patient to make a decision on their own independently it's not like oh you have a choice do you want a defibrillator or not what do you think no it's 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 shared it's a conversation it's the it's the dialogue that's shared um i mean it's it's i think it, it gets more interest now because it's got this name shared decision making but in reality 
informed consent for surgical procedures Same thing. is one version of shared decision making. I mean, it, you know, if you have a brain aneurysm and you have to have brain surgery to get it done, I mean, that risk uh, that you're acknowledging for the brain surgery is, is compared to the risk of not having the brain surgery and, and, and you decide. And we can debate the effectiveness of informed consent in terms of truly informing people and shared decision making is trying to elevate that, but it's also expanding it to other decisions that are less, less obvious uh, in the past. So I have an idea. All right. I'm going to put it out there. Two things. Number one, we'll talk about the next edition of the book, the book. Um, but I think we need to do a deep dive into shared decision making, A, for the book, and B, I think this is a webinar comp conversation yeah. to help educate patients on what it actually means and what it doesn't mean. And no, it's not up to them completely. But we also miss another piece of that equation because what you may want and what the patient may want, the payer may not. Yeah. So there's, there's another entity to this conversation that we all have to take into consideration and we will be in, in, in embarking on another adventure in HCM and that is payer education mm -hmm. because a lot of insurance companies don't really understand us and they think right. you guys are just trying to charge a lot of tests and whatever, mm -hmm. but they need to understand we're not trying to waste resources. We're trying to be good consumers of resources. And we don't need the wrong tests at the wrong time. We need the right tests at the right time and the right procedures too. So I think that's a deeper conversation. And I'd love to get some payers to the table to have that conversation with as well. Yeah. How do we do that better? So this is all part of advocacy. It just doesn't stop. If you go, if you finish that path, that one's yeah. got to get taken care of. Exactly. So we have a couple of questions. Um, genetic testing. How often should it be revisited? Somebody here had genetic testing at Mayo Clinic five years ago. Um, is it time to revisit genetic testing? Yeah, it's, it, it's, a, it's a good question. So um, the results of genetic testing, if a variant of some kind was identified, whether it was deemed as a HCM causing variant, or even if it was a variant of uncertain significance, should be rechecked every handful of years. I'm gonna not be more specific to that because we are seeing that variants that we thought used to be clearly causative of HCM have now been found in families that don't have HCM. And so that downgrades the importance of that variant for that family, which means their family needs to be screened a different way. So, so that's an important thing. In terms of, do I need to submit another blood test for genetic testing? That probably, I, you know, that time frame that that the question posed five years, the answer is probably not, but it's worth asking your team. But most of the panels haven't changed in a quantum level in terms of the number of genes they're looking at. At Mayo Clinic, if that testing was done as part of a research protocol, we may have been doing well, we don't, we'd want to go back and look at see if that research pro protocol was comprehensive or whether it was targeted for a specific research interest at that time. So it, it, it's every five years is a reasonable time frame to ask the question. Good answer. We have somebody who's watching that I kind of want to bring up the case because I, I'm going to be working with her local center to present her case in a, in a bigger way soon. Um, community care, community echocardiography. I'm going to leave you on a controversial issue. Mm -hmm. So local cardiologist, well-meaning person finds a person with HCM and a septal measurement of 3.8 in a woman under five foot tall and under the age of 35. And does Halter, does Ziopatch comes up with multiple runs of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia and sends her home and says, we'll follow up in a year. Thankfully, this patient advocated for themselves, found us. Mm -hmm made me a little nervous. Mm -hmm. And I called a friend and I said, friend, center of excellence director in the local city, please mm -hmm. see her. Got her in the next day, admitted her. She's got her ICD for a couple of days now. But what else was found is a gradient of over 200. Mm -hmm. And on MRI, her wall measurements were in excess of four. So if your community doctor 
is seeing this anatomy and not referring, you need to refer yourself. And you need to communicate, in my opinion, back to that doctor and say, let me be an education for you because we can't catch them all, all that way. We have to get those doctors to know more. And this is still happening in 2022. Yeah. Isn't that frightening? It, it is. It, it, it is interesting because, you know, I, it, in general, the trend is, is away from that. So the, yes. the certification of Echo Labs uh, made a definite difference in the quality of echocardiograms done at, you know, across the country. So increasingly the echoes that I'm seeing patients or, or their referring physicians send to me ahead of time, like, oh, the answers are there. That's great. We can, you know, we, versus, oh, we need to bring them here because we need to do an echo here necessarily because they, they missed some pictures or those kind of things. The quality has risen generally, but you're right. Just like you opened the whole podcast with, it's not mission accomplished yet. We still have education to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's and there isn't a single venue of education. I think that having patients aware know that there's resources, uh, your organization and other cardiomyopathy HCM organizations to help them understand where there might be things being missed is super important. And then, yeah, I mean, if that patient uh, is referred to me and I see that kind of decision making or things happen before, having to figure out how, how to communicate back with the original physician, hey, these are the things that are going on that are important to this patient and patients with HCM as, as an educational uh, opportunity as well. Well, I think we went a whole big circle yep. and we ended where we started, which is a lot of HCM. Mm -hmm. Steve, I'm really excited that you joined us for the first time on Tales from the Heart. And you'll be back again in two months. And I don't know what our topic will be then, but we'll discuss it. Um, and we've got a lot of other work to do as well. Um, happy to announce to the world, because I don't know that we've actually announced this yet, that you are the co-chair of the Medical Affairs Committee for the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. So thank you for your service to the community in that way and every other. And um, we got a lot of work to do. So for everybody tuning in, thank you very much. Stephen can ask you to just hold here for a second. And we're going to say thank you and goodbye to Facebook. Have you enjoyed this episode of Tales from the Heart? We hope so. Please visit us at 4hcm.org. Become a member, become a donor, become a volunteer. Great news, everybody. HCM Academy is now available online. What is it? It includes online sessions, learning about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, patient stories about HCM and their management, and an opportunity to join online live with an HCM specialist to go over the slides, ask questions, and dig deeper into your understanding and knowledge of HCM. All CME courses are free and you can find them at 4hcm.org or at thehcmacademy.com. The Big Hearted Warrior Tour continues. For the latest dates, please check 4hcm.org. And thanks to our sponsors, Bristol Myers Squibb, Cytokinetics, Invite, and Boston Scientific. Did you know discussion groups are available? At 4hcm.org, Monday through Friday, almost every day you can find a discussion group. Whether you're interested in learning more about ICDs, pre-myectomy, screening your family, there's a discussion group for you. Even if you just want to learn how to balance your mental health, we have that too. So please join us for one of our live discussion groups, moderated by a peer volunteer, and you can sign up in advance at 4hcm.org. Just check the calendar for events. Please contact the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association at 4hcm.org or by calling our office at 973-983-7429. You can contact the HCMA by email at support at 4hcm.org. Tales from the Heart, a podcast from the HCMA, is made possible through sponsorship from Boston Scientific, Cytokinetics, Tanaya, Invitae, and Boston Scientific.